So this is, uh, first thanks Johnny for throwing another conference again, uh, which today's last year was a lot of fun, and like he said, part of the appeal of the conference is that after the conference is over, you get to hang out and meet a lot of people. So I hope to have that experience again this year. And also this is a really interesting venue that Johnny just told me the history about, so if you're curious, you should check it out, it's, it's pretty wild. So this is imperfect architecture, or trying to accept impermanence. Um, I'm an architect at Bleacher Report. Uh, we've been using Elixir in production for about four years. Um, and as, you mentioned, as the person who was here earlier mentioned that small teams uh, don't hire people, it turns out that we are hiring people, and one of the reasons that we're hiring people is because we have had such success with, um, with Elixir, and also just the way that we've rewritten our platform. So we're hiring for backend with Elixir, front end, which is mainly React, and iOS, and Android. And so from that, you would think that you know, everything is great with Elixir, and people have talked up about how great Elixir is and these kind of things. And Elixir and OTP, more specifically, have really changed the way that we develop our applications, of course, but also the way that we think about architecture and even the way that we think about how we organize our teams and how they report to each other. And you know, other talks I've given, you know, Jose and Bruce and I wrote a book, Adopting Elixir, about how to use the language successfully and, and how you can have this uh, approach at your company and how you can reap the benefits as well. But that being said, you know, it's not all roses. Everything, th bad things happen. Uh, bad decisions yield bad results. And so we'll start, oops, we'll start from complete system failure. So this was perhaps the worst night of my time at Bleacher Report, uh, and it was ironically about a month after our, our best night in terms of traffic. So last year, um, we, we broke our traffic record on the NFL draft night, and we brought it by quite a lot, and everything performed really admirably, and, and in previous years, we'd all been there just to, to be on call in case something broke, because something inevitably did. And this year we just sat around and ate tacos and chatted. So it was really nice and it, it gave us this real sense of confidence that what we were doing was, was correct and that we were on this trajectory to have higher traffic rec records and do all these things, with these great things with Elixir. And so it was especially frustrating because it was only a month later. How do we screw things up in a month to make, these, to make our system on a night that was only slightly, it was like two or three or four times what our average traffic was. How did everything fall apart? And part of it, I mean, and largely this was my fault because I had taken this idea, this, this is fairly hubristic, and like we're, we're on the right track, we're doing the right things. We have these legacy bottlenecks that we know about, we have some other sort of couple dependencies that we know about, but everything's been fine so far, so let's, let's move forward with this idea. And it was really a static way of looking at a problem. So, and this is part of, part of taking our old infrastructure and moving it to the new infrastructure was, how do, we, how do we refocus everything? We had a monolith and we had some s smaller service apps and now we have service-oriented service architecture. How do we do that to, to, so that we can maintain the health of, of, the, of the system and expand it for years to come? So we decided let's use an API gateway. So for an API gateway is exactly what this is. So you have one, the, uh, one of the advantages of the API gateway is that it's simple. Like from, from a client perspective, it's essentially a monolith. You have one, one host that you call, you get all your information from there. They don't care what changes behind the scenes, what changes you make, how things are reordered. To them, they just call this host, give me this information, and, and it comes back. And it's also more secure because you have one endpoint. You can say, close everything off except for this one host, and then traffic comes through here. Because in the past, what we had was, we had all sorts of ways where you could call into the system, and which made it really static, and we had these legacy clients that we couldn't sunset. So we had to do all these weird things to wedge things in and out. So this was really appealing for those reasons. However, there's a big disadvantage with the API gateway, as you can probably imagine, is that there's a single point of failure. If your gateway goes down, you're screwed. So this is <coughs> what happened most of the time. And this is a simplified version of our architecture, but essentially the, the server icon on the bottom is the gateway and the server A and B on top are just two services. And we have two types of requests that would come in. One would be a single service, so you would just say, I don't know, I need this type of data, and it would only come from this service, and the second would be a multi-service request where we would need to pull data in from multiple sources to return the full response. And this worked pretty well, for the most part, and with the single service request, you had the advantage of going through the gateway, but you had the, adv the added latency and other problems and also load on the gateway itself. So that night, this is basically what happened. We had these couple dependencies, and we also have a lot of third-party, we have third-party providers for scores and other information that we can't control. And we were looking at this from a very, or I was looking at this from a very hubristic point of view where it's like everything has been successful, we're doing the right thing, let's keep going. 
you know, let it crash and all this stuff. Um, and we let it crash, but the problem was that it crashed over and over and over and over to the point where nothing, nothing could, could, could happen. And it was, fr it was frustrating too because we have different levels of data. We have primary data, we have secondary and tertiary data and so on. And so we want to deliver, we obviously want to deliver the primary data, but the problem here was that like the tertiary data was the, what was causing this, this outage. So I'll show you in a graphical sense what happened. Um, I don't know why is this so. Let me just use this. So this is what happened. So on the top, that's the response time. And our response time hovers around 100 milliseconds. And this is for about a 24-hour period. So you can see that the, the high spike there was quite an increase. And it was a sustained, a sustained increase for about three hours. And on the bottom, you can see the reason I have the number of 500s is obviously it cor correlates to what you see above, but from the, bottom, from the graph below it, it would appear that we don't have any 500s except for that, that period of time, which is absolutely not true. We have 500s, and 500s are important uh, because they tell you what's going on. What, we usually get a lot of junk requests, we get a lot of phishing requests and these kind of things, uh, and it's important to understand that those are there. But this was such an order of magnitude problem that, that, you can't, that it looks like everything else is fine. And as it happened, this was right before my vacation. I was, <laughs> I was going, and it, so it was a very, <laughs> It was a very strange month for me because we celebrated this great victory with, with, the, Elixir, with the Elixir system. And then this was a night where we, no one was even on call. We were just, we were, I was literally walking out the office when, when the, you know, the, pay, the oxygen alarm goes off and, like, and, start, and it just sort of continued into the night. And, and it left me in this place of sort of, of self-doubt and confusion. And I was on my vacation and, you know, and my wife and I were, it was our first year anniversary and you know, she's like, why are, you, why are you moody all the time? We're in this beautiful place and you're, you're moody and thinking about this stuff that doesn't really matter. And it matters to me because I take pride in my work and I take pride, like uh, Rob was saying, you know, you're a scientist, you're a craftsman or craftsperson and you do all these things and you want to feel good about them. And so I started thinking, you know, what, what, what did I do wrong? What, what, other than making the wrong technical decisions, how did, how did we get into this, into this point? And so I think, it can be best summed up as to falling into this idea of this perfect trap, right? Like, we want to have the perfect architecture, we want to have the perfect design, we want to have the best, just basically we want to have a superlative and fixed iteration. And that's not really the way things work. And, you know, no one ever also writes about, like, good enough design, I guess some people do, but, but in my mind, I was trying to plan this target architecture, and I thought of this as this, this is what we need to do, and then we can, like, a checkbox, move on to the next thing. And I've always been interested in etymology as, since I was a kid, for whatever reason. And in high school, where other people took German, Spanish, or French, and in this, for whatever reason, in this public high school in Lexington, Kentucky, where I went, Latin was offered. So I took Latin for four years, and it really changed the way that I look at the world, and especially the words that we use. So when you, when you think of the word perfect, you think of, you know, without, without flaw, without error. But in, you know, the perfect actually means finished. So the perfect tense is I ate, I ran, et cetera, and so on. And the opposite of perfect would be not perfect or imperfect, which is this idea of, you know, of continual and changing and, and, and never ending. And if you, and so, to, to, and I thought this was a really interesting idea, this idea of, of mutating things, of changing, of accepting change. And so I looked online and I was like, surely someone has come up with this idea of imperfect architecture in software before. And there are a couple of blog posts talking about how software is ever changing and, and this and that, and that's, sort of the idea that I was going for, but it didn't quite capture the entirety of it all. So I looked up imperfect architecture without the software, and this, I found this article, <laughs> Experience, Experiencing the Architecture of the Incomplete, Imperfect, and Impermanent, which is a title I'm proud to be proud of. And it's by this professor, Rumiko Honda, at University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And in the article, uh, Honda talks about how Architecture is not simply when the building is complete or perfect, that's not the end of the building's life cycle. In fact, that's just one stage of the building's life cycle. And I thought, yeah, this is really cool. And, and there were examples throughout, throughout the piece about different ways of irregular architecture or imperfect architecture. But this quote really appealed to me. And it says, in 16th century Japan, we find an artist, Sen no Rikyo, who relied on the properties of the imperfect, which in Japanese are called wabi in order to create physical objects that induced participatory in interpretation in the viewer. And to me, I was, that, that sounds, with maybe through somewhat of a distorted lens, that sounds like what software development is. Physical objects would be the architecture, 
and inducing participatory interpretation in the viewer, that would be the programmer. And it all, it all relies on this idea of the imperfect, this idea of wabi. And so I never heard of this term wabi. But fortunately, Aoi, as it so happens, my wife is, is Japanese, and she's a Japanese calligrapher. So she's very familiar with this concept. So usually when I talk to her about tech stuff or whatever, she, you know, she's like, oh, that's interesting, but I don't, you know, that's what you do dur dur during your day, and this is what I do, and so on. But this, her eyes lit up. She's like, oh, this is great, this is wabi-sabi. This is what I try to practice every day with my, with every, you know, stroke with a brush, with every piece that I complete. This is the idea that I, that I put forward. And so wabi-sabi is these two characters, wabi on the left and sabi on the right. And they have sort of contradictory uh, meanings. So wabi is the noun and wabu is the, the dictionary verb form. And it's this idea of feeling sad, troubled, apologizing, but also the intention of finding fulfillment in something simple and something beautiful. And sabi, or sabu with a dictionary form, is again sensing beauty and tranquility, quiet, quietude, loneliness, and how things age because of time. And the wabi-sabi aesthetic is, in Japanese, is akin to the sort of Greek aesthetic, the classical aesthetic, the way that you, you know, how things were, how you aspire to this, and it's a continual struggle. So this aesthetic, beyond the words themselves, mean asymmetry, roughness, but also simplicity, economy, austerity, intimacy, and appreciation of sort of the natural order and relationship of things. And I thought that's actually that's a really nice, I mean, it's a bit, maybe it's a bit too romantic for an idea about software architect, about software, but I really like the idea of this, of this um, because it's, it's contrary to moving fast and breaking things. Like, it's a mindfulness. You, you accept the fact that you're going to fail at times, and hence is the loneliness. Like, at programming, or any real endeavor, I guess, is when you're working by yourself can be very lonely because you struggle with a problem and you try to find your way through it. Um, but it, it's also something beautiful when you do find that solution or when you do find a solution. And this implies that different solutions are possible. It doesn't mean that there's only one solution to the problem. This means that there's a solution at this point in time. And then you can go forward and find other solutions. And it, it really breaks you free from this mold of thinking of things as being right or wrong. It's correct at this point or not correct at this point. And to use Aoi as an example, again, like when she, she does performance pieces and she does co commission pieces. And for the commission pieces, she'll write the same character, you know, tens or literally hundreds of times. And I go in her studio and the, 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 the walls and floors are covered with all of these, these wa washi paper, and, and then, and each one of them is a discrete solution. And sometimes the first one she do, uh, she, that she writes, after she does all these other ones, she'll come back and take that first one and decide that this is the right one. And I think this is a really nice perspective to think about software development, because it doesn't, it eliminates all, it eliminates this rigidity and, and it allows for more solutions. So indulge me a little bit, and we'll go through this and try to apply this to architecture. So architectural components, right? You have systems and you have people. Most of the time we talk about architecture, we talk about the system. You talk about data-driven system, you talk about a monolith, you talk about service-oriented architecture. But we don't talk about the people that, is, that are building that. How do you build a team to support this architecture? What happens when these people leave? How do you retain people? And, and how do these all fit together? And of course you can't have one without the other. So let's start with systems, since that's sort of what we think about when we think about uh, architecture. So this was my mistake when I thought about the system lifecycle. So in the, in the example of the a API gateway, I thought, okay, so we have this plan, we have this old messy architecture that has these crazy circular dependencies, and you know, we, we had all the, we, we've, been, we've been burned by these things over and over and over. So let's just, let's pick an end goal, which is the API gateway, and let's go forward with it. And we coded it, you know, we coded it, we QA'd it. Um, part of the reason that we had this problem was because we didn't have full coverage of this, and so we didn't expect this. And then we deployed, and we were done. That's a discrete thing. This, okay, so now we have an API gateway architecture. That's done. Checklist. Move on to the next thing. And of course, life doesn't work that way, and software development doesn't work that way either. It's much more like this. System life cycle is you introduce either a new concept, a new feature, a new piece of technology. You evaluate it. You adjust it. And then you're back to the beginning again, because at that point in time, you have a new system to adjust and evaluate and so on. And it makes it much more easy to think of production instead of as the endpoint as just another piece of the never-ending puzzle. So if we go back to the API gateway, uh, we weren't ready to give up on this idea quite yet, right? It's like people have done it successfully, Netflix has done it successfully, their scale and complexity is much greater than ours, so we should be able to do this as well. 
So we revisited the, the points of failure. What have we done wrong? Uh, wh where had we overlooked these things? Um, and like I said, we came to see the solution in a different light. We didn't, or I did rather, I didn't see this as this is the final solution, this is just a solution. And also going back to this idea of, of simplicity, we decided instead of changing a bunch of things at once, we would change them in isolation and see how that responded. And that was another problem that we had, was because we were all sort of working in towards the same goal, but not at the same time. So, you know, the left hand didn't do, didn't know what the right hand was doing, and these, this kind of thing. So we were introducing libraries that we hadn't fully tested, and since we have such a high scale, a lot of libraries that we're using, especially like the newer Elixir libraries, um, they've never been put under this kind of pressure, so we had to go back and reevaluate these things. Um, and so we identified something that should have been obvious, especially from an Erlang and Elixir OTP point of view like cu couple of service dependencies. Like we, when I, when I spoke about this primary, secondary, tertiary information, I'm like why are we assuming that all this stuff is important to the user? The most important thing to the user is the content and the, the speed at which the content is delivered is secondary. If we, if we deliver content slowly, they'll go somewhere else. If we don't deliver content at all, they're gonna go somewhere else. So for instance, if you go to, if you open the app, on the, one of the views, you see the content which, which comes from one service, and you see the scores data which comes from another. Content we can control. We have, all, we have full control over that. Scores data, we don't. We depend on a third party to, um, to deliver that. And that third party is, like everything else, it has outages. But, we, but for whatever reason, I didn't consider this. This is a grave oversight on my, fault, on, my, on my part. And so we looked at the app from, from the front end, from the app side. Like, how, how do we degrade this app? How do, we, how do we think of this app in terms of, you know, the way that we should think of things, that things fall apart? I was looking at, I was going, I was viewing this through the, the, the lens of a product manager or of a product person who thinks, who wants the app to behave perfectly at all times. And that's just simply not realistic. Computers fail, networks fail, bugs exist. So we work with the, with the product team to go through each, each view on the app and decide which pieces are important and which pieces are not important. And you know, and this was a group effort. It, and this was sort of also the understanding that, you know, architecture is not a solo thing. And it, it, we had to, it was a lot of back and forth with product because, you know, they wanted to deliver the best experience, but we wanted to deliver a realistic experience. And so one, one small change we made on the back end was, which got us a lot of uh, success was, uh, and again, this is partially, this is something that we done in the, in the early days when we started with Elixir, and we never had this problem, so we didn't revisit it. So <coughs> when we make requests to the, the primary, the, the content server service, which is the primary data source, and then we make an asynchronous call using task async to the secondary or tertiary service to return that information. And in the beginning we were using um, task.await. So task.await has a, a default timeout of five seconds. If it exceeds that five seconds, it crashes. And this was the problem that we had that night. So it kept both these, the uh, tag service and the gateway were in this cycle of crashing over and over, and it can never recover. And because these two were crashing, that ended up crashing the content service as well. So it took, you know, like on the graph earlier, it took about three hours to get over that. And so uh, James Fish uh, on the Elixir core team, he and I give an OTP workshop every now and again, and I think he, he put it really nicely. So he's, he, when you should use task.await versus task.yield, so tasks that await, you should always expect it to return. And if it doesn't return that, that means there's a serious problem. And that the, it should crash because that should notify you that there's a serious problem with the system. Tasks.yield, on the other hand, that's when you, you, unpredictable data or uncertain data or maybe trivial data. So this is a change we made. And on the top was the original, on the bottom we used tasks.yield. And as you can see, uh, you can just match on the, on the return. So you either get an okay result or a nil. And this was really all the change that we had to make on the various services. And so now if, if the scores don't come in, everything comes through. So it looks like, it looks the same thing like this, except we get the, except things go, come through. So it was a small change, and it was, a, it was also a way that we rethought about, about how we architect our, our system, was even though, we were, even though the tagline of Erlang let it crash, and it certainly did crash, we weren't anticipating this, and we didn't think to, to be defensive around this. So this small change uh, greatly improved the reliability of our content, which is the most important thing that we serve to our users. 
And we also can do these things, we add metadata to responses so we can see how often these upstream services fail and adjust accordingly. And the final thing we did was we really wanted to keep this gateway idea, but it's kind of silly to have a request for a single service go through the, the gateway service and then onto the other service. So we use Fastly as our CDN, and Fastly allows you to intercept requests. So now we have these in, like, it's just a VCL, a varnish config. And now when a request comes in for a single service, it still goes through the gateway server URL, but Fastly picks it up and redirects it to the service, to the appropriate service. So this greatly reduces the amount of, of load on our gateway service, and it also reduces the latency, not by much, but by, by, by some. So this made a much more resilient uh, platform. And it was some simple changes that we should have, that how we've been thinking with this mindset of, of, continual, um, of continual integration and con con continual change, we would have done this instead of thinking of this fixed thing as, okay, the API gateway, we're done. And this is the response times since then. Um, I think this is for, the, for this year. Um, and this is not our, our gateway service, but this is the service that fell over during the, that night. And it still has a pretty strong dependency on some of the legacy stuff that we're moving over now, and we should have it done soon. But this is much more realistic in, with, what, with what we want to have. Like, we want to have around 100 milliseconds as our response time, uh, or sub-100 milliseconds, because apparently that's, according to Google, um, about the, the level of time for someone to perceive. You can't, a human can't perceive the difference between 20 milliseconds or 80 milliseconds when receiving content. And again, like number of 500s, this is more accurate to what we have. Um, we have, you know, uh, so Bleach Report is owned by Turner, and and we have uh, they do some pen testing, these kind of things. So this is this is well within our expected 500 level. And then we'll show you just the availability. Uh, the availability on the left is that night, uh, which is pretty terrible, um, and then how we measure it. And then the availability on the right is what it's been since then. And you know, it's not five nines, but it's well within. It's much better, and it's within the acceptable range of, of what we're looking for. And so now we've talked about how, how to revise an idea that was, was a, uh, how to improve upon an idea that, that had a good idea, that had a bad result, and move on for it. Uh, but there's also the idea of, you know, technology isn't static. And we certainly made a lot of changes at Bleach Report over the last few years. It's just like uh, most other people here who, who have adopted Elixir or are considering Elixir uh, or why you're here, because you want to add new technology. So let's give an example of perhaps finding an optimal solution for, or sub, a seemingly suboptimal solution for incorporating new, to new technology, but it, when considered on a, on a longer continuum, it makes more sense. So because we've had this good success with Elixir and because our platform is stable, uh, we're reaching out to do more experimental or more greenfield type projects, and that's one of the reasons why we're hiring. And for one of the projects, we decided that we would try a new technology for us, which is Kafka. And it makes a lot of sense. We use RabbitMQ for a lot of messaging, but we wanted a durable uh, log, essentially, message queue. And Kafka made a lot of sense. And so there's a few drivers, uh, some Erlang drivers. There's a C uh, driver with an Erlang wrapper around it. And then there's an Elixir driver. And so, of course, we defaulted to the Elixir driver, which might have been a you know, mistake because the Erlang, like most Erlang libraries, it's been around for a lot longer and has a has a has been through uh, battle-tested cases. Um, so we, we try this, and it turns out that the, pro we, the producer works fine. It sends out the messages, no problem. But the consumer on the, with using the Elixir driver kept crashing. It kept falling over. And it's like, this is a real problem. Like, what are we, what are we gonna do here now? We've committed to this technology. You know, do we go back to Rabbit? Do we do something else? How do we evaluate this? And now, using uh, Rob's uh, Drabel door spectrum, <coughs> which I probably mispronounced, uh, my, my inclination was, well, let's fix the driver. Like, this is, this is, the, this is the stuff that we live for. Like, I, this is a problem. We can fix it. We, and then if I look at the business side, the answer is, well, you don't know anything about Kafka. You just, you just started evaluating how are you going to fix a driver with a, complex, uh, with a complex application like Kafka. And so what we decided to do was, which might seem counterintuitive at first, was we, we, used, a, we used a Ruby driver. And we made a, a Ruby, uh, app, Ruby service that all it does is consumes messages. And so in my mind, I was like, this is bad. Like, I don't, like, we just moved off of Ruby. Why, why are we going back to Ruby? Are we going to get back into this trap? Of, you know, what does this mean about our, you know, what does it mean for the long-term health of our platform or long-term decisions of our platform? And I think it was a good decision. 
because it just it works at this point in time. But we're, we don't have you have to choose the least worst option, and this was and this is a good option. And and also a lot of the the issues we had with the legacy Ruby applications were not Ruby's fault. They were our fault because we didn't maintain them, we didn't upgrade them, and so this this is a suboptimal situation or suboptimal solution. But it works for now, and it, and then every three or six months we can reevaluate it. Now the problem comes when we decide to integrate more more thoroughly with Kafka. Like, what does that mean for the long for our, for our system? And we'll address those when we get there. But for now, this is this works out really well for us. And I think that that's a, a a nice a nice compromise between what we would actually like to have versus versus what's available. And finally, our, the next bit is maintaining the system. So of course, if this is in a continuum, then everything is always being maintained and upgraded and in these kind of things, or it's not being maintained and it falls apart. And this is where the people aspect comes in. Uh, people are the ones who maintain the system. You know, the, we write the code, we maintain it, and so on. And the people life cycle is, of course, very similar to the system life cycle. You hire people, you know, you you try them out, or you the the employee and the employer evaluate each other. You decide, well, maybe this person goes is better over here, or maybe this person better over here, or maybe they leave and go somewhere else. And I mean, this is just the natural cycle of things. And so since we're trying to expand and grow our team and all of these things, we want to make sure that we keep this, 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 uh, the, the close-knit group that we have, and we also want to ma maintain, make sure that we have opportunities for people to advance and to, to, you know, to get what they want out of the job. So we have this idea of trusted autonomy at Bleacher Report. And we, ha we, we try to hire people who are you know, independent, competent, and who you know, really are engaged and excited about this kind of thing. And these people don't like to be micromanaged. I mean, incompetent people don't like to be micromanaged as well, but they, maybe they need to be. Um, <laughs> but so you certain, uh, maybe you shouldn't hire them in the first place, but another story entirely. So, so autonomy, we have that autonomy where you can say, we trust you to do this thing that you say you're gonna do. And the, wit and the trusted part of that is that we have these standards in place. Uh, in another talk, I uh, talked about how we implemented these service reviews. So all of our services are essentially a, um, within reason, identical to each other in terms of in terms of standards, documentation, tests, and these kind of things. So we already know that you maintain these standards, then that means that the code you're going to write is probably pretty good, or is it, or is within the realm of acceptable uh, code that we that, that you write. And so this is sort of what it looks like, and this also looks like a bit like a supervision tree, right? So you have. Uh, this, this, uh, we have two programmers here, and so each service that we have has a service has two service owners, and the service owners are essentially architects of this service. So they they're responsible responsible for uh, keeping dependencies up to date, for bringing up uh, like this part of the app needs to be refactored. This is you know this part of the app is is lagging and so forth. They also are the sort of the guardians of the code. So uh, we use GitHub's code owner's file. So they're the only two people who can approve uh, pull requests. So when code review comes through, that means at least one of the service owners has to sign off on it. And what that also means is that since they're responsible for it, if something blows up, then it, they're at least, it's at least partially their fault because they allowed the code to go through. And we have these standards in place that, so they shouldn't, so we shouldn't have code that goes through that doesn't, um, that, uh, that doesn't meet their standards. And this isn't a way to punish people. Like, that's just part of responsibility, right? Like, if everyone writes bad code from time to time, bugs slip through. So the idea isn't to punish. It's just a way for us to distribute the work to different people. Because if, if we hire, like, four or five or six or seven other people, how is one person or a number of people going to, one, maintain the entire architecture in their head, or two, be able to maintain responsibility for all of these other applications? So this has worked out pretty well for us so far. Um, and now that all the app, apps are up to date, we've implemented this idea of application reviews. So application reviews sort of take it, uh, flip it around, so it's a bottom-up type thing. So since they're responsible for the service, uh, we meet, uh, like the, a few people meet like twice, the, each service is two or three times a year, depending on the frequency of development of the service. And this is a way for them to say like, this is what changed, and to think of, again, to think of the application as this never-ending changing thing this mutating thing, and how do we keep it from, you know, how do we allow it the, to keep, the, to maintain the health of this application? And it's, again, this is working out pretty well for us so far, and we'll have to see how when we scale to add more people to see if we can replicate this. 
And a nice benefit of this is bi-directional ideas, right? Like uh, a lot of companies where I've worked, you know, here's your ticket, here's how you do it, and then you do it. With this idea of service owners and trusted autonomy, now the people who own the service can say, I know this service better than you do. This is a problem, and this is a way that we can fix it. So uh, we have a push notification system. Uh, it was originally in Ruby. We wrote it in Elixir, and it was you know, significantly faster. Everyone was very happy. This was something that everyone, you know, people on Twitter and internal people and the upper management were all really pleased with this because it was, it was perhaps the most noticeable immediate thing, uh, the benefit that Elixir brought to us. But since it was our third Elixir application, it sort of aged a bit. So one of the, one of the people responsible for the app said, you know, we need to address some of these things. Um, it was using the legacy APNS and GCM uh, HTTP protocol, so we need to move to HTTP2. And uh, this developer sort of went through and did everything, and, and he said, this is my proposal, and this, and, yeah, and this is my proposal, this is what we're gonna do, and we went through it, and, it's, and he, he had some issues with the, again, with the somewhat untested Elixir libraries, but this was, a sub, this was the optimal solution because he worked with the, the developer of the library to fix the problem. So they went to, there's no one at our scale had used his library. So we went through and he fixed all the problems. And so, uh, so Mike was able to take this idea that he had and was able to, to on, of his own volition, to go through this thing and come up with this idea, propose it, and, and now when we roll this out, we have a faster, we have an even faster push notification system coming like next month. So this is a really nice idea of a way for people to express their ideas and, and, to introduce, and also to introduce ne new technology. This is the same way that we introduce new, new technology. So if you're working on a project, here's a proposal, we wanna try this out. And now that we have our system in such a way that we can sort of isolate failure or, I or isolate experimentation, we can just, it's really easy to duplex traffic with Elixir uh, because processes are, cost nothing to spin up. So we have this, we call it ghosting, but essentially duplexing. So whenever requests is coming, you start a task.start, it fires uh, to the staging environment to the experimental uh, stress testing environment. And so we get to actually see real production traffic and we get to see how that, how that affects the system. And <coughs> this also, you know, the, the nature of everything is ebb and, ebbing and flowing, right? Um, and my uh, close friend of mine, I was having some frustrations with work a couple of years ago. And you know, I was trying to explain it to, ha to him, and you know, why is this this way? Why is this this, this way? And I was so coming from I don't know, someone, something of an arrogant position where I was like, you know, I've done all this all this stuff. Why you know, why why are the outcomes that are happening not in my favor? And he said to me, you know, no one is irreplaceable. You know, I thought, well, well that's kind of you know, why are you saying that to me? Like, you want me to leave? And um, and then once I I sort of looked at it from the other side, and it's a much more freeing thing. No one's irreplaceable, which means that you're free to leave your job whenever you want. Like, if I were, if I were to leave tomorrow, like, should I feel guilty about leaving Bleacher Report? No, absolutely not. This is, we, we sh you, you work hard at your job, and then when you decide to move on, you, time t you, you move on. And by, ex by expecting and allowing for this idea of people coming and going, it makes it much easier to predict how, how things will go. So the idea, and also, um, so when someone leaves, we just pull someone else and add them to another service review, or we hire someone and we pull them onto another service. And so we have this continual shifting of change around our service owners, um, and the knowledge is spread out pretty evenly, so people have a good idea of what's going on, and it's not just going, so if, you know, if someone left, we wouldn't, nothing would fall over, we just, you know, we'd have an adjustment period and we backed up to scale. And then also the nice thing about this is that we like to hire junior developers or people who are just starting out with Elixir or people who have a, you know, passionate or people who are about passionate about the language, whether they use Ruby, Python, Scala, whatever. It's, if they show aptitude, then we'll bring them on. And by, by embracing this ebbing and flowing and this service owner concept, it's really easy to get them up to speed because they get to work essentially with a mentor who's a service mentor who brings them up to speed and then they will start adding on new services to their uh, responsible responsibilities as well. And finally, so bringing back to this idea of this circular idea of imperfect or impermanent architecture, um, this really helped me as also from a planning perspective, like what, you know, what are the consequences of my decision? Like it, does, it doesn't have to be the right answer for a long term, it has to be the right answer right now. And it's a number of, of uh, from a number of answers. And you know, one of the problems, even with like the one of the push, when we first started out with Elixir, it was like we kept trying to optimize stuff. We just we didn't want to deploy it to the production. We wanted it to be perfect. We wanted it to to have no errors. 
and this way, when thinking about things in these terms, it, it doesn't matter. Like, what you deploy to production is what you deploy to production. And because it's, it's very inexpensive to deploy new things to production, you don't have to over-optimize. I mean, again, all of these statements are grounded in the context of having uh, high, high test coverage, uh, QA, um, and the standards that we have in place. So it's not like you're just throwing something random, like, random up on production. It's something that, that we believe that through all of our metrics should, be, should perform well. And some of the advantages beyond that of this type of thinking is that it's non-dogmatic. Um, when I first started out as a programmer, and probably a lot of people have similar experiences, where you would read, like, this is the way to write a controller in this language, or this is the way to do X in this. And so instead of you know, thinking about this idea as, as a possible idea, I was like, OK, well, I just need to copy this down, and then, OK, it works, and then move on. Um, by thinking of having uh, thinking of these best practices as a guide rather than as rote or, or, or scripture, you, you get to see that it, it's, it becomes a much more learning experience and it's not a single path to get to, to where you want. It's a, you know, an infinite number of solutions to where you need to go. And building on that, it's this idea of creative solutions. Um, some of the, the problems that we've solved have been done in unorthodox ways and some of them have been unorthodox and have proven to be successful for a, a long period of time and some of them have proven to be unorthodox and haven't been successful, so we've reevaluated them. And again, this doesn't, this means that uh, we both iterate in small chunks and we both acknowledge that we have a number of competing, competing solutions. And that just because one works out, it doesn't mean the others are failures. It, on the contrary, it just means that this is, for this point in time, the best solution that we have. And what I think is also really nice is that it, it includes a, a shared responsibility. Like, architecture is not one person's responsibility. It doesn't matter what your title is. If you work at Bleacher Report and you're on the development team, it's your responsibility. Whether it's just one service or a number of services, we all work together. Um, and we have this, and moving to this model of having these sort of superficial-ish trees has really enabled us to, to get messages from developers that we would have missed before. Like, we wouldn't have had this problem uh, when everything fell over that night had we, had, had we been talking to each other better. And how do you talk to each other better? You have these supervision trees and, and these uh, application reviews and these other check-ins that we do to make sure that everything is, is working together and working the way that we want it to do. It also, this idea of growth decay growth is, this is just the natural order of things. You know, this is in Honda's article. It's, that's one of the first sentences is talking about the building, the, the perfect building and then how things degrade over time. And the wabi-sabi concept, like you embrace this you um, <clears throat> you, em you embrace this idea of, of symmetry and also dissonance and also understanding that whatever you do now is going to decay in a month, five months, or a year, or so on. The, I think the trick here is to, is to have these practices in place, like standards, test docs, et cetera, so that your growth periods are strong and your decay periods aren't as bad. Like, if we look at the Elixir apps that we had today versus the Ruby apps we had before, we had growth in terms of features, but then the decay was, was so massive that, the, that every sort of growth period after that was offset so greatly by the decay that it never fully recovered and we never got back to that, to that initial sort of growth period. And the hope is that with these standards in place and these ideas of, of looking at it as this continuum, we won't have that, those deep uh, valleys of decay anymore. And so hopefully that will lead us to, to come up with more exciting things and uh, build out these stable platforms with exciting features. So uh, thanks. And again, we're hiring, so if you are interested in working on this, come see me afterwards. So. As I was curious, um, when you were talking about the um, kind of design, working with product to decide how the system can function in an integrated state in an acceptable fashion, uh, did you put any specific uh, monitoring around those states? And if so, how did you uh, implement that? So we use um, Xometer for all of our monitoring, and we just send the, use the StatsD module to send it to um, to Datadog. And we'd already known. I mean, it was we already knew where the problems were, and we even we even had the graphical representation to show and the data to show where the problems were. We just never realized the extent to which this could bring down the whole system. And part of the, I didn't really talk about this before, but also uh, in the past. And this is probably uh, maybe this might be a holdover from sort of a monolithic way of thinking of things. Our API responses were all or nothing. So you had all you, so you had even so like play by play data changes pretty frequently. You know, if a basketball game, it can change multiple times a minute. Um, 
So why would you send the entire response that has the play-by-play -play data and also the content and also any other metadata that might be involved? So that was another thing we did was we started designing our APIs to be these incremental APIs or progressive APIs so that, uh, so that we wouldn't have this. And that sort of, those lines of demarcation were, were, what's help, uh, were, were uh, what helped us with product to say, this is, you know, what, are you, what are your top five things that you want to always happen? And this is the way we design our apps. And of course, the, any third party library that we, or any third party data that we receive, we always have to treat that as unreliable data because we have no control over that. And that's bitten us a few times as well. So, and it's really hard, and it, it, I mean, it, it's a struggle. It's a back and forth thing with product because they, they're like, well, that's not good enough. But if we don't have control over the API, like you just have to accept that this is a, that this is a possibility. Um, and once, once they sort of came to accept that, that, that was, that's, gone on forward. And also, like, because of the success, the success we've had since then, we broke our traffic record uh, two times additionally last year, and those were without problems. So it seemed like this idea had some merit, and they were able, to, we convinced them that, that, that because of these, these successes we were having, that this was the way that, that this was actually a reasonable way to go forward. Um, so I'm noticing that word uh, progressive API design. Are there any resources where someone could look for what that means? I think we have a loose understanding. Oh, um, no, was, I mean, I don't know if it's actually an actual term or not, but we were just sort of, when we were, we were sort of uh, regrouping after this and decided to, to, to uh, split up the APIs and, to, and going forward to design things like this, this is what we came up with, but there surely has to be something on, I don't know, maybe there's another term for it, but if not, maybe we can write a blog post about it, if that would be helpful. Okay, cool. All right then, thanks, Ben.